Aloha everyone, Maverick Mike here. Hey, Komo Mai, come on in. You're doing something a little bit different today. I've been working with this old Delta table saw and it's served me, but not served me really, really well. So it's time for an upgrade. So I just purchased a rigid R4514. We're gonna put that together. Let's get right to it. All right, the first thing I did upon opening the box was just go ahead and grab the owner's manual and read it. According to the owner's manual, these are the tools I will need to put this thing together. A combination of square, some C-clamps, it doesn't really say what size, a framing square, a flathead and Phillips screwdriver, and these two set screw wrenches that came with the saw. In addition to that, I got out my own stuff. A 3 8 ratchet, a 13 and a 14 millimeter wrench, a 4 and a 5 millimeter set screw socket, uh, and a little extension just in case I needed it and uh, 13 and 14 millimeter 3 8 sockets. So while I was inspecting the uh, package with all the bolts and stuff, I also found this. So it's not listed in the instructions, but it is a 10 millimeter. So I grabbed a 10 millimeter wrench and a 10 millimeter socket. So you might want to add that to the tool list. All right, as I did the unboxing, I noticed that it was packaged very well and the saw comes with the table facing the bottom of the box. And I found it easier to get the saw out of the box by tipping the box upside down so that the feet were on the floor and then I could just lift the box up. Then I went ahead and put the sub-assemblies together and here's sub-assembly number one. Let's assemble sub-assembly number one, which is the upper tube, the right handle, and the left handle. And what I noticed on these pieces is that they're labeled one and two in a paint by numbers kind of fashion, which is kind of nice. So let me give you a close up view of this. This is the left handle, it's labeled number two. The right handle is labeled number one. And corresponding on the upper tube, there is a number two where this tube goes in. So let's go ahead and put those together. Subassembly two, step number two, putting together the center brace and the inner leg assembly. This is the center brace. There's the numbers three and four, and they line up to numbers three and four on the inner leg assembly. So they're assembled together using these bolts. They're uh, M8 by 80 millimeter, using the large spacer, which is about 30 millimeters across. And this spacer gets placed between the center brace and the leg assembly. You may want to take note that the stop pin of the center brace um, engages this release over here. All right, bolt, spacer. Line, nut. And repeat on the other side. Subassembly number three, step number three, mounting the upper tube to the leg stand using the M8 by 80 carriage bolts with the small spacer. Small spacer is about 20 millimeters. And I had a little bit of a time with this, so let me show you what I did. If you had two people to do this operation, it would be a lot easier. But since it's only me right now, let me just show you what I did. So on the leg stand, I put a weight behind the back portion of it, and I ran a bungee across and back just so that this thing would be uh, more of in an upright position allowing me an easier time to assemble this thing because it's a little bit difficult, it's a little bit cumbersome when you're by yourself to uh, assemble this thing otherwise. So this is a little tip to uh, make it quicker, easier, and more efficient for the next person who wants to assemble this stand. So once again, we're lining up the numbers. Six is on this side, five's on that side. Two on here, two on there, one's on that side. So, and I also recommend that you put the top ones in first, number five and number six in first, which will then make it easier to do number two and number one. If you do it the other way around, it's doable, but uh, you'll be fighting with it a lot more. Well, small spacer. Align the carriage bolt. And just finger tight a nut go to the other side, do the same operation. So I'm doing number six and number five first. Um, otherwise, 
It's kind of like fighting with an octopus. Number one and number two, same operation. Carriage bolt, spacer. Get that carriage bolt to sit in the square. Yeah, finger tight. Same thing on the other side. Carriage bolt spacer. Add a line. And then the nut. So if I didn't have that weight and this bungee holding this thing up a little bit, holding it together, I'd be really fighting with this thing. It would be flopping all around. Be very difficult to uh, do. This makes it easier. Hope that helps. Step number four, installing the feet. If you'll notice, the feet have a, this angle right here. The illustration in the manual shows that it's facing towards the center. For this one, you need a uh, 14 millimeter socket or wrench, and you're also going to need that five millimeter set screw to fit in the bottom of the foot. Keep this from turning. This one you can go ahead and just tighten up. There won't, uh, cut, there won't be an assembly problem with this. Just snug. Likewise on the other side. All right, time to install the wheels. Ugly side in. Sexy side out. Large washer, wheel, small washer, and nylock nut. And to tighten this nut, you'll need a 12 millimeter socket or wrench. So at this point, I'm just gonna get rid of my weight and the bungee. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, tighten up all the bolts that I have finger tight. And then um, we're gonna check the operation of the latch over there, make sure that's working and not binding. So bolts number one through five require a 13 millimeter socket. Now I'm just tightening this thing up enough where the spacer doesn't move and then I'm going like an eighth of a turn max. Okay, that's pretty good I think. All right, so we've completed step number six, which was to check the tightness of all the bolts, check the operation, make sure this was not binding, and also the operation of the release lever on the other side. So we're gonna move to step number seven. Step number seven is the mounting of the saw to the stand. Using these four bolt holes here, one, two, and two on the other side. Instructions say use these quarter inch bolts, and it also says use wing nuts. So didn't come with wing nuts. It came with these self-locking um, nuts, and that's fine. There was just a discrepancy between the instructions and what we actually got. So let's go ahead and do step number seven and mount the saw. Now, the second thought, before I mount the saw, I want to take a look underneath and see what it looks like. And there's also a piece of uh, packing material that you have to remove. Here's that piece of styrofoam right here. And to remove that, you unlock the bevel and then turn the bevel to release that styrofoam. Now that we're down here, let's look under the hood, see what it looks like. So looking at it from underneath, I noticed that the bevel operation gears are both plastic. Here's the gear for the bevel and the teeth that are riding on, they're both made out of plastic. However, the gears that raise and lower the blade are made out of metal and I can't operate it right now very much but um, as you can see they look like they're well greased and they're metal so that's a good thing I like that all right let's try and mount this saw on the stand it looks like it's going to be a little bit awkward and probably be a better idea to do this with two people however I don't have two people so I'm gonna pick this thing up and try to at least get um, the legs on the side that I'm standing um, 
at least on this bar right here, and then maybe I'll try to lay it down. Hopefully that'll work, but uh, this is gonna be a bit awkward. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Now we're just going to go ahead and line up the bolts and tighten them up. So I'll be using that 5 millimeter Allen and a 10 millimeter socket to go ahead and tighten this up. All right, let's see how this thing folds up. up quite nicely all right according to instructions the next thing to do is uh, remove and install and align the throat plate the throat plate has a little lock it's a lock position you just rotate it to unlock and you can lift it out of place the throat plate has one two three four set screws in it that can adjust the height of the throat plate as it sits in the saw so right now, that's not bad because it's below the surface. Well, what I want to do is I want to kind of just bring it up where it's just touching and then lower it just a little bit just so I can get the throw plate as square and as even with the tabletop as I can. Actually, the throat plate is hitting right here. So we're going to have to lower this one, actually. And this is a 2.5 millimeter set screw. Okay, that's not hitting there. Let's bring it up. Just a tad. Well, let's check this out here. Almost looks like the tabletop is not square. Let's take a look. As you can see, I got a straight edge, a level on here, and there's a pretty significant amount of uh, bow to this table. Running across at the end, just on the inside of the left miter, I can get an 11,000th field gauge in there pretty easily. And on the right side, so this center bubble right here is right placed over the center of the uh, blade. And this over here is the right miter, coming out right here. There's a little bit of a dip on the inside of the right miter. As you come out to it, it gets tighter. And then on the other side of it is probably the high point. And then from here, it fades down. So that at the end I can get, oh my, maybe a 20 or probably a, easily a 20 thousandths in there on that side. So the tabletop is not really flat, which is too bad because it feels like a sturdy enough aluminum, but it's not square. 
So this is the center of my uh, level right here, going corner to corner. Not level. And the other way, corner to corner. It's a little bit better from this way, that corner to that corner. So this table is not really square, which is a shame because it seems like a decent enough, solid enough tabletop. It's just not exactly square. And I don't know, 11 thousandths is not very much. However, if I was setting the valves on a car or an airplane, being 11 thousandths off would be horrible. So, <laughs> anyway, using my speed square, there's a little bit of a high point right here. So let's lower this. This is a 2.5 millimeter. Is it locked? Yes, it's in the locked position. Okay, this is low. Let's bring this one up a little bit. And let's bring this one up just a little bit. corner is just a bit high. Let's bring this corner down. Alright, so we got that throat plate adjusted where I'm happy enough with it. So let's go ahead and check the squareness of our blade. We're going to just set it to zero degrees and see where it comes out. So, first thing I'm going to do is unlock the double lock lever. And then rotate this until we hit zero, until it comes to a stop, a mechanical stop. And then I'm just going to lock the lever. I'm not really forcing it, but it, as it is at a mechanical stop right there. Okay, looking at the pointer, it's pretty good. And it looks really close to zero. Um, it looks like that pointer could use a little bit of adjustment right there. You can move it to the left a little bit. But let's take a look at the blade. All right, looking at this blade from this angle. My speed square is hitting the bottom of it, but not hitting the top. And I have a gap of about 25 thousandths here, and I'm not hitting the blade. I'm right on the uh, flat part of the blade. I'm not on the tooth. So let's move it over to the other side and see what we got there. All right, on this side, we're hitting on the top and loose on the bottom. That one's less than 25. So. We need to adjust the blade so that the top tips out towards the right. So before I do that, I'm going to th pull the throat plate off and I'm going to take the blade off and I'm going to look and see if there's any kind of machining or any other kind of uh, debris that's possibly knocking the blade over to one side. In fact, let me just spin it real quick and see. Nope, looks like it's spinning true. So. The only thing I'll do is I'll just make sure that the nut is tight. Pull the tools off the side, which are located by the power cord. Okay, looks like it's spinning true. Let's see how that looks now. Lock that thing. Still leaning out of the top. All right. Let's go ahead and adjust that. So, the instructions say to loosen the bevel lock lever and turn this between five and 10 degrees just to unload the stop. Then you can just turn this adjustment screw and adjust the angle, the zero angle of the blade. Moving this clockwise until that gap disappears. 
try it there. Still got a gap. Try it there. That's going on here. All right, I tried to do a blade adjustment and found that it could not adjust. So I went and did a quick diagnosis. And right here is the cam that adjusts and it hits the saw stop. And the bolt that goes through here is loose. So the bolt turns, but the cam will not turn with the bolt because it's too loose. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to grab that thing with my hand or with a pair of pliers and tighten that up. And if I can't tighten this up, the saw will not be uh, adjustable. So let's try that and see how it goes. All right, I apologize if I get in the way of this, but I'm gonna try and grab the cam here with a pair of pliers and tighten the bolt from the front. Okay, I've snugged that up and let's see if this will be able to adjust now. All right, we definitely have a problem here. Using the specified method, there's no way that I can get this bevel on the saw set at zero degrees. It will not square up. So by right, I should actually just be returning the saw as being unadjustable. But I want to make one more effort at getting this adjusted. I was fooling around with it and I found an alternate procedure in order to get this blade squared to the 90 degrees. So let's go ahead and do that right now. I'll show you what I did and how I did it. And then uh, you be your own judge and whether you, if you have the same problem, whether you're going to return your saw or not. So let's take a look at that. All right, so on this cam, you only want to turn it clockwise. So go ahead, loosen up your lock lever, turn this so that the pointer's at 15 degrees or so and you're unloaded the cam. Go ahead and move the cam only in a clockwise direction until it's at the lowest point where the cam will not hit the stop when you come back. So. That's the position that I have right now. So I'm gonna turn this and you're gonna hear it go clunk. Right there where it stops is where the motor actually hits the top of the table. And I can't go any further than that. So what I'm gonna do is I've got my speed square up here right in the center of the blade. And I'm just gonna go ahead and adjust the uh, bevel until I have 90 degrees. I'm on a blade, square. Okay, right about there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and lock. Use the lock lever, lock it into place, let it go, and double check. Make sure that your blade is 90 degrees to your square. Looks like it moved a little bit. I'm going to do it again, a little bit more. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm going to lock it down in place. Okay, that looks good right there. I know you can't see it from here, but uh, there's no daylight now between my speed square and the blade. So, after you've done that, grab your Allen wrench that came with this thing, engage the adjustment, and only turn it clockwise so that 
the cam just touches the stuff on the bottom side of the saw. So I'm going to stick my head over here on the other side and I'm going to look and then I'm going to turn this until the cam just touches that stuff and then we're going to stop right there. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Now let's just see if we can get a repeatable result. Unlock. Let's move this around. Move it back. Hit it. Lock. Okay, now I don't have an air gap. Looks like I was able to repeat that. So new procedure, use this procedure if you're having trouble using the one in the factory manual. Um, and interesting, I'll uh, show you where the pointer is now. Okay, you can see how far past the factory mark that pointer is right now. And at this point, the motor underneath the table is just about hitting the top of the table. It is that close. So the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and adjust the pointer so that it zeroes out. And just a Phillips screwdriver. I'm going to hold it from the back. Loosen that up a bit. Align the pointer to zero and tighten it up. Let's call that good for right now. And we'll move on to checking the 45 degree bevel. All right, I loosened up the level block lever and adjusted that all the way over to where the pointer's at 45 degrees. Stuck my speed square in there. And as you can see, we do not have 45 degrees here. So I'm going to try to adjust this the same way as I adjusted the other one. Um, I'm going to follow the factory procedure first to see if that works. Um, and if not, I'm going to go ahead and use that other procedure uh, that I had just described to adjust the bevel. The instructions say that once you get this set, move the pointer. Well, that's a big mistake. Don't move the pointer. Put yourself a separate little mark so that you know where 45 degrees is. All right, after looking at the cam, for the bevel adjustment for the 45 degree position, I decided not to use the factory recommended way of doing things because once again, I would have to turn it counterclockwise, which would have the tendency to unscrew the screw from the cam in the back. And those screws are only held on there tightly with a little bit of blue Loctite. And that's why the cam on this side, the zero degree bevel side, was able to move because it's not locked into place with that. So in order to avoid that of the 45 degree adjustment, I'm just going to loosen things up, adjust it back down to 15 degrees or something like that. Turn the cam only in the clockwise direction so that it doesn't loosen up on the screw that it's attached to. Move it to the lowest position where it's not even going to touch the stop. And then I'm going to go ahead and adjust the blade to 45 degrees, lock it into place, and then I'm going to move the cam to where it just touches the stop. And that's the procedure I'm going to use for this. So if you're having a problem with the saw, I recommend that procedure. Release the bubble lock lever. Turn the adjustment back someplace far away, maybe 15 degrees or something like that. Now I'm, I'm going to show you guys the cam on the other side. You can't see it. It's a little hard. I'm going to have to freehand the camera. So let's take a look at that. I'm moving the cam so that it's in the lowest position. Okay, that's pretty close to this lowest point. So let's go on top and see if we can adjust the blade and then uh, get this thing tightened up. So what I'm going to do is I've got the bevel lock lever released. I am just going to go ahead and give myself some slack here. And then I'm going to see if I can't just get this thing to align with my speed square in the 45 degree angle. Okay, that's 45 degrees right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and move this adjustment until it just hits the stop. And then I'm going to stop right there and I'm gonna look at it from the back side while I do this. 
Okay, that's hitting right there. Let's just make sure this still looks good. Okay, that still looks good. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and release the lock lever, move this thing around and see if I can't get a repeatable result. Stop, lock it in place. Okay, that's good right there, and I think that's as close as I'm gonna get. Let me move the camera now, and I'm gonna show you where the pointer's actually pointing at, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so there you go. I put a little piece of tape there, and then um, put a pen mark on it. And I'm not going to actually mark the saw here, just in case I actually do return it. And I'm not going to move this pointer to the 45 position, because if I do that, I am going to mess up the 90 degree angle on the other side. And that's way more important to me than the 45. But the bottom line is on this, that every angle between the 45 and the zero, from the zero, will be messed up. Once you go past the zero, if you go 5, 10, 15, 30, whatever, you're gonna see how far that's off and how far it's gonna be messed up. So if you wanted an accurate cut with this saw, you'd have to put a digital angle meter on this thing every time to make sure that you got a really accurate cut. Would this work more for a uh, rough and ready kind of a contractor where you're just doing some framing or making a window casement or something that doesn't require a high degree of finesse? This would probably be okay, but if you wanna do furniture, if you want precision, hmm. Not quite. All right, so now we're gonna check the alignment of the riving knife and the saw blade. So there's two adjustments on this. The first one we're gonna do is the horizontal check. So first thing you do is you put your square on your blade and you slide it until it hits the riving knife or just hits the riving knife. So this side is just barely touching. and this side hits and comes to a solid stop. So the first step to do these adjustments is to remove the throw plate. Just unlock, I'm gonna remove it. There's uh, some sets of screws in here. These ones with the uh, set screws are for the horizontal adjustment. And these two small ones right here with the flat head are for the vertical adjustment. Okay, that looks good now. Uh, as I tighten down the horizontal adjustment, it would move every time, so it helped if I put a screwdriver in between, there's a gap in here, in between the bolt and the rest of the riving knife to try to keep it stabilized as I tightened it, and that seemed to work. So now I can look down this thing and I can see just a tiny bit of the blade sticking out on each side of the writhing knife, which, and that's where it's supposed to be. Let's check this vertically here. Okay, I'm not gonna mess with the vertical adjustments. I think that's okay. The horizontals were messed up. And so far, this has been the specification that was closest to being correct uh, so far yet on this saw. All right, let's install the rip beds and uh, Check the squareness to the blade. This is a little bit too tight going on. It's not going on evenly. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, loosen this nut a little bit, put this on, and then uh, tighten it like a quarter of a turn at a time until the fence is snug, but I can get it on and off easily. So this is a 13 millimeter nut. it a couple of turns. So now I'm going to tighten that nut a quarter of a turn at a time until we get uh, rid of the slop in the fence and it bites the way it's supposed to.
Okay, I'm happy with that. Alright, I was going to check the squareness of the fence to the blade. However, the instruction manual said to check the miter first. So, here's the miter. It actually is not a bad looking unit. It is made out of metal. And there's a threaded insert here for if you wanted to put a handle. And a couple places to put bolts if you wanted to put a sacrificial fence on the front. And um, the handle feels pretty good and moves pretty nicely. It seemed to be uh, a pretty quality uh, miter, especially compared to the one that I had last on that old Delta. In addition to that, it has preset so stop screws for, for zero and for 45 degrees or whatever you want to set it as far as the degree goes as long as the screw can reach it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to check this. We're going to make sure it's square to the blade and that the presets are correct. So I'm going to be checking for zero and 45 on each side by using these adjustment screws. So these adjustment screws are Phillips, Phillips head, but you have to loosen up this little nut first and that's an eight millimeter wrench. So let's check this out. All right, so let's install this miter. Has a nice little square on the end as a, for a locking, it goes into a T-square. I don't know if this is a standard size three quarter knob, but it's a T. So my first initial impressions is that it's, it slides pretty good. It actually catches on something. I'm not sure what it's catching on at this point. And there's a bit of play, maybe a degree or two worth the play in here, possibly more. So first impressions, seems to be pretty good. Okay, let's check it out. All right, so I wanted to check out this miter, make sure that the stops were correct, where zero was zero, a 90 degree angle, and the 45s were 45. However, this kept hitting on something. There's, a, there's something in the miter that's causing a roughness, a looseness, and I can feel it catching a little bit. So, when I took this thing apart and looked at it, I noticed that this screw right here, the central screw with, that the miter gauge rotates on, is proud of the surface here. So I went to try and tighten it with my screwdriver. And it would not move. I'm afraid I'm going to strip it. it. Stops right there. So this screw right here, the head of this thing, is digging into this miter gauge track here. And eventually over time, since this thing is proud, it's going to make a groove in here. This is quite loose. And if I bring it out just a little bit, there's quite a bit of play in this thing right here. Maybe I would suggest that uh, Rigid made a little tighter tolerance right in here. Or added more of these T-slot um, guides. Maybe one here and then one here. Just to tighten this thing up a little bit. I'm not sure whether I'm going to return this or not. But for right now, just for the sake of doing it, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that uh, the 90 is 90 or the 0 is 90 and the 45s are good too. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is check the 90 degree, make sure it's square. So I've got my square up against the blade here. I have a piece of paper underneath here just to help me see a little bit better. So I press my square up against the uh, flat part of the blade, making sure I'm not riding on any teeth. And push my square, push my miter up until it just touches. And I can see some daylight over here on this side, on, on the left side. So it's kind of at this angle here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen up the uh, nut back here and then adjust this so that just when I slide this and just touch it, it's square. Gonna use a eight millimeter wrench to loosen up this nut. And 
Okay, and that's on there, that's square, this is square. So let's try not to move this. and then tighten up the uh, nut a bit. Okay, the 90 is set, let's go for the 45s. So, setting the 45 degree angles are a little bit more difficult. If I had a much larger 45 degree square, it would make it easier. But I do not have that, so um, I'm just using a bit right here to access the top of the screw. I've already loosened up the nut, and all I did was grab my speed square, hold it firm against the saw, flat spot with this loose so that it can rotate around and the screw backed off I just put it up against the square at 45 held everything snug and then screwed the screw in until it just touched try to hold the head of the screw in place and just snug the knot a little bit All right, all right, flat against the blade. Let's check this out. Okay. Good. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side, but I'm not gonna show that. All right, I'm done with the 45, so I'm just gonna come back and confirm 90 and then adjust the pointer. So once again, I've got my square up against the blade. I've got the pin pushed in, rotate over, lock, okay, square blade, square with the fence, and let's adjust this pointer. Okay, happy with that. All right, we're going to go ahead and adjust the rip fence to the blade. There's actually two separate operations for this fence. Uh, one that is the main fence, the distance to the blade, and also this low fence has an adjustment distance to the blade to square it up to the blade. So we're going to do the main one first, which means that we got to take this off and flip the small one back to the other side. All right, so I moved the rip fence over to about 80 millimeters from the blade and locked it into position. I have one tooth over here marked so that uh, I can use the same tooth when I rotate it from one side to the other and get the same measurement. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the measurements now on each side and we're gonna be checking for differences here. So this first one, right to the flat part of the blade. I'm doing it to the flat part. The manual recommends using one of the uh, teeth but I would prefer to use the flat part. Okay, even against the fence. Right at 80 millimeters. So, I'm gonna rotate the same tooth to the back side. And take that measurement again. Right at 80 millimeters. Well, I gotta say I'm surprised that this fence came out right on the money. Almost everything else was off. Um, in one way or another, but the fence, being squared to the blade, is right on the money. That's a good one. Now let's check the lower fence. So, just in case if you actually have to make any adjustments to your face because it's not parallel with the blade, there's five screws you need to loosen. There's one, two, three, four, five. Then you go ahead and put your blade, your uh, fence back down, lock it into place. Do the adjustments and then lock these one, two, three back in place. Unlock the blade, turn it over, and then finish tightening the other two screws underneath here then you should be good to go. All right, just for greater than giggles before I took this fence off of here, I just wanted to see if it was square. And so I put my square up against it and I'm hitting the bottom part just fine. 
but the portion above the uh, track for the T-Bolt has a gap. And with my feeler gauge, it measured to be nine thousandths of an inch. Interestingly enough, on the other side, on this side, yeah, on this side, everything is okay on this side. It's just on this side, and it's the same way all the way down. So there's like a nine thousandths gap here. And down there on the far side. So I looked in the manual and there was no adjustments for this. And it looks to be machined that way. It looks like one piece. So I'm going to have to live with that one there, I think. Maybe if I have to get really precise on something, I'll just put strips of tape on this edge until uh, I get a square all the way across. But that's the only way I can think of to fix this thing right now if I really, really needed that level of precision at nine thousandths of an inch is not very much but it's there all right here's the procedure for measuring the low fence to make sure that it's square to the blade as well so you take your rip fence off you lay it on a flat work surface with the pointer pointing up and then you go ahead and you measure from the top of this surface to the rip fence on both sides and if it's square you're good to go and if it's not square the measurements aren't the same and there's two screws on either side, they get loosened and you can adjust the fence that way. One and one thirty second. And on this side. Yeah. I'm off. So I have to loosen up the screws and try to get them even on both sides this is going to be interesting. I think I'll just try to loosen one side, these two screws first, and move them to the one and one thirty second mark. We'll see if we can do that. Get it up here and hold it even and tighten the screw down. See how it goes. Okay, it's looking a lot better there. Messed up that side a little bit. Let's see if it's the same. Not quite right. Not quite right. So let's get it right. Okay, good to go. Moving on to the bevel locking lever adjustment. Go ahead and unlock the bevel lever. Move the saw to the 45 degree position. Lock the lever and then attempt to rotate the adjustment wheel back towards the zero position or counterclockwise. If it doesn't move with moderate force, the adjustment is correct. So if you can rotate the bevel adjusting hand wheel, come to the back of the saw over here, and then turn this bevel lock nut right here, clockwise, about a quarter turn. Checking the table extension. So with the table extension lever locked, pull on the table extension, and it should not move. If your table extension does move, come underneath the saw towards the back, find this coupler right here, loosen the nuts, turn the coupler counterclockwise, recheck to make sure that it's not moving. If it's not moving, go ahead and tighten the nuts back up. And you're done with that. Outboard of the right-hand miter, you can see that there's just a little bit of a gap close down here, and then it begins hitting my level about here and continues until the extension fence then it drops off significantly, leaving a gap. So I can't do anything about this portion of the table. It's a one-piece machine section. However, there is a height adjustment for the table extension, so let's go ahead and do that. So the illustration shows that this height adjustment should be made with the extension table butted up against the rest of the table. However, I want to move it all the way out 
and see if I can get the height adjustment correct there and push it back in and see what it's like because I suspect that extending it all the way out there where it's supposed to go uh, will definitely have a different reading than if I did it right here. So I'm gonna try it that way and see how it goes. So I'm gonna release the lock and uh, pull the table out as far as it's gonna go. Okay, until it hits the stop. Now let's take a look at this. This larger level is a little bit off, showing that the extension table on the right-hand side is low. So, let's go ahead and adjust that. On the right side of the saw, outboard of the miter gauge, you can see how significant that gap is. I can get a 30,000 feeler gauge in here very easily. This is approaching a spark plug gap sizes, 40 thousandths at least, I'm sure. And uh, you can see how significantly it falls away from the miter gauge side and away moving outboard. So I'm just going to try to align the table extension with the top of this and see how it goes. All right, so looking up underneath the table, there's four nuts here that have to get loosened, one in each corner. And they're really an odd size. The 10 didn't fit on there, the 12 didn't fit on there, 10 being too small, 12 being too big. Put the 11 millimeter wrench on there and that was really floppy so the best fitting wrench that i have right now to fit on those nuts is a 7 16 so i'm just going to go ahead and loosen these up a little bit then i'm going to come back to the top of the table and try to level it best i can then we'll move it out and see how we did wow if i make it even with the rest that's not going to work it's got to have this big step right here so what i'm going to have to try to do is align it just with this portion of the tabletop right here um, and see how much it bows down on the on the end okay so I've moved my weight over now I'm gonna try and get these even all right so I made the adjustment pulled the table back out to lock it into place put my level on here with uh, a weight so that it's centered above the blade and while it's not perfect, it's touching right here. So from here to here, it's relatively flat. So I'm gonna call that good. That's as good as I can get this. And there's no more adjustments after this. All right, time to set the rip fed scale indicator to the blade. So you wanna do this with the anti-kickback pawls removed and the blade guard removed with the saw blade up and at 90 degrees or at the zero point. You want to go ahead and move the rip fence until it's just hitting the blade. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjust the pointer here until it's right at zero. Let's loosen up the screw, move that pointer, see how much it moves when I tighten it back up. Okay, good to go. All right, so let's unlock this thing and uh, double check that using a square. So I'm just gonna unlock it. I'm gonna move it out here to 12, 12 inches. Lock it down on 12. All right, square and 12 inches right out to the outer tip or the inner tip, I should say, of this blade. So 12 inches, we're good to go. And we're right on the money out here. So I'm happy with that. I'm really quite happy with the fence, the way it was set up right from the beginning. It was correct and it was accurate. So before you install the anti-kickback balls and the blade guards, you want the riving knife to be in its utmost position. Then go ahead and install these items. To put the anti-kickback balls on, line them up with the rear slot on the riving knife, right here in the center. So you wanna press this button in as far as it will go. Line up the slot, press the button in as far as it will go, push down until it clicks into place, and then the button will snap back. Then you want to make sure it's secure and that the balls are free to move. To remove it, you just press the button in fully and pull it up. So to install the blade guard, you're going to be using the center position on the riving knife along lining up with this bar right here. You're gonna drop it in place, push it towards the back of the saw, 
drop it down, and then lock it in place like that, and test. So I purchased this saw because it's supposed to be able to cut a 4x4 in one pass. So, got a spare one here. Let's go ahead and rip this thing and see how it does. Let's go ahead and do an initial startup. This is supposed to have a soft start feature, so let's check that out. And it's supposed to have a feature where it shuts down in about four seconds, so. Okay, I really like the way it started up. It was smooth, it was quiet while it was running, and it did shut down within about four seconds. All right, so the cut is pretty clean. I didn't move it through that smoothly. So there's some uh, marks from the saw blade, but that was on me, not on the saw. But it cut in one pass. Cut up a four by, it ripped a four by four in one pass, so I'm pretty happy with that. I think I'm gonna call this good. All right, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, you deserve some kind of a medal or something, man. My hat's off to you. Anyway, this is a rather comprehensive review of this table saw with every adjustment down into the finest details. And bottom line is I have decided to keep this saw. Um, this is more for a contractor. Uh, for that, it's just perfect. It's just fine. No problems. For me, at the hobby level and maybe at the furniture maker kind of level as a hobby, um, it's not quite as accurate as I would like it to be. However, I have been able to make really good, accurate cuts with this thing, and I've built several projects with it so far. So anyway, the bottom line is if you're a contractor, you can use this saw right out of the box. It will work for you. It will do everything you want it to do and more. Uh, the thing that really attracted me to this saw was that I could cut 4x4 four four material with it, and I got it at a really good price point. I ended up paying about $400 for this thing. It was $150 off the regular price, starting at about $600. Then, um, due to some expert help at Home Depot, Home Depot, if you're listening, give Nelly a raise. She did a great job. It went over and above beyond the call of duty. Anyway, she signed me up for a credit card, and I got an extra 50 bucks off. So I ended up paying about $400 for this saw, and at this price point, that's really good. So in spite of the issues that I've discovered along the way, the squareness of this table being primary, um, I would buy this saw again, and I... Since I went through every single adjustment on this thing, I feel like I know this saw intimately well, and I'm actually quite happy with it. So if you buy this rigid table saw, you'll know how to set it up. Mahalo, and a hui ho!